Once upon a time, IBM was a household name. They were the most well-known computer manufacturer in the world, period. But today, while people still recognize the name, virtually no one buys a computer from IBM. In fact, you can't even buy an IBM computer even if you wanted, given that they sold the business to Lenovo nearly 20 years ago. This is quite surprising, given that by all accounts, IBM was very much a first mover within the PC industry. They launched their first consumer PC way back in 1981, and I mean, the company's name itself is International Business Machine. Yet, by the late 1980s, IBM was rapidly losing market share to newcomers like Dell and Compaq. Heck, even the operating system that they had funded had turned into Microsoft. This downtrend only got worse in the 1990s, as IBM would go on to post the worst quarter in corporate history, having lost $4.96 billion. IBM's market cap would have in value, while the S&P 500 nearly doubled. Fortunately for IBM, the dot-com bubble would give them some room to breathe, as investors were lenient to say the least. But as the dot-com bubble collapsed in the early 2000s, focus shifted back to IBM's underperformance within the PC market. And this eventually led to IBM offloading their most recognizable business. Considering the situation, you would think that IBM was headed towards bankruptcy, or at the very least, a painful decline. But the exact opposite would actually take place. IBM's revenue, earnings, and market cap would all skyrocket. And IBM would even overtake Microsoft for a couple of years until Microsoft had their own resurgence. And today, IBM stands at a market cap of $133 billion, which makes them the world's 90th largest company. Clearly, losing within the PC industry hasn't killed off IBM altogether. So here's the rise, fall, and resurrection of one of the most iconic brands of all time. Taking a look back, the roots of IBM actually date back to the 1800s to four different companies, which included the Bundy Manufacturing Company, the Tabulating Machine Company, the International Time Recording Company, and the Computing Scale Company of America. By far the most important of these was the Tabulating Machine Company. This company focused on creating data processing machines for punch cards. This proved to be relatively successful given that it was a must-have at manufacturing plants and factories. But the problem was that revenue from this business was sporadic and unreliable. I mean, how many times are prominent factories going to need to buy punch card machines? Maybe once a few years, if that. So, the founder of the company, Herman Hollerith, would shift the focus to a larger project, the 1900 census. The census challenged his machines like never before due to the raw volume and scale. But Herman would successfully complete the project, which gave him some notoriety within the industry. Despite this though, it didn't take him long to fall back to ground zero. You see, the US only conducts a census once every 10 years, so revenue became sporadic and unreliable once again. While Herman very much wanted to turn this around, he was getting into his 50s and his health wasn't quite holding up. So he decided to sell the company to a man named Charles Flint for $2.3 million. Flint would combine this with a few other businesses and create a new company called CTR. And very quickly, it became obvious that Flint was no rookie at business. He didn't change anything technical about the company. Instead, he simply focused on expanding the use cases and the sales force. He would hire an executive named Thomas J. Watson, and Watson would basically become the father of IBM. The first thing that Watson did was hire a bunch of salesmen and teach them the intricacies of enterprise sales. He instilled the values of company pride, unbeatable customer service, and professionalism. Watson also expanded the scope of the company from just selling punch card machines to providing corporations with large-scale tabulating solutions. This turned out to be extremely successful, and Watson would end up doubling the company's revenue within just four years of taking over. Very soon, CTR would begin expanding internationally to Europe, South America, Asia, and Australia. Watson would also hone in on the company's branding and public image. One of his first branding efforts was creating a company slogan, and for this, he would just reuse a slogan that he thought of at his last job, Think. You might recognize this slogan today with the Lenovo ThinkPad. Anyway, Watson now had a company slogan, but there was still something that was really irking him. Watson hated the name CTR. He felt that it was clunky and confining. 
1924, he would change the name of the company to IBM or International Business Machine. It seems like this name change may have been a bit unlucky though, as the Great Depression would roll around not much later. The Great Depression would hit IBM hard. Given that businesses were collapsing left and right, and given that IBM was a B2B business, they had an extremely tough time keeping clients. Nonetheless, Watson didn't panic. He was a strong believer in the idea that if he had a great team that was building useful products, demand would follow. Watson would not only hire more employees during the Great Depression, but he would even increase their benefits. IBM was one of the first companies to provide group life insurance, survivor benefits, and paid vacations. But despite Watson's positive approach, the effects of the Great Depression were very much evident throughout IBM. IBM was building up a massive inventory of tabulating equipment with no market to sell to. But as Watson was hoping, an opportunity would eventually arise, and it was massive. In 1935, FDR would sign into effect the Social Security Act, which required tabulating employment records for 26 million people. IBM was the only company that bid on this contract, and by the end of the depression, IBM would evolve from being a mid-sized company to being an industry leader. Their dominance would only grow with the onset of World War II as IBM's tabulating equipment would prove instrumental in the war. The Allied forces widely use IBM's equipment for mobile record units, ballistics, accounting, logistics, and of course, punch cards. To keep up with all this demand, IBM would grow their manufacturing capacity exponentially, opening factories all across the Northeast and California. Despite all this growth, Watson had a fear in the back of his mind. What would happen when the war came to an end and government spending was cut substantially? Watson began addressing this issue early on to prepare as much as possible. He increased IBM's international presence and played a major role in the formation of the World Trade Corporation. But it turned out that none of this preparation was even required. As soon as World War II came to an end, the US would get knees deep into the Cold War. The government no longer needed tabulating equipment per se though. What they wanted was a highly intelligent machine, also known as a computer, and this is what got IBM into the PC game. Unfortunately, Watson never got to see this evolution as he would pass away in 1956, but he very much laid the foundation for IBM's pivot into the PC market. Just one year after Watson passed away, IBM would introduce the programming language Fortran. IBM would follow this up with a slew of computers such as the IBM 1401 and the IBM 1403. But the breakthrough didn't happen till 1964 when they introduced the IBM System 360. The feature that set apart this computer was the fact that the hardware and software were no longer bundled. In other words, you could upgrade and swap software. This proved to be instrumental for NASA and NASA would end up using IBM's computers to land the first humans on the moon in 1969. This was no doubt the golden age for IBM, but Watson's fears from 25 years ago would start coming to fruition. After winning the space race, the government would heavily pull back on spending. While the government pulled back their contracts, IBM was by no means in any distress. Over the past 30 years, IBM had built an international brand and had major companies as clients, so they were by no means going to die. But given that they had maxed out on the corporate and government side of things, IBM was forced to look for new ways to grow and this led them to the public sector. The only problem was that IBM had virtually no experience selling to everyday consumers and it would show. IBM didn't know it at the time though and they would launch Project Scamp in 1973. This project is what would eventually lead to the introduction of IBM's first personal computer in 1981 to IBM 5150. This computer actually turned out to be a massive success because it made PCs relatively affordable for the first time. The 5150 launched for a price of $1600, and while that was by no means cheap as it translates to $5200, it was way cheaper than everything else on the market. The Xerox Star for example came in at an eye-watering $16,500. Meanwhile, the Apple Macintosh came in at $2500. So for budget-oriented customers, which is most customers, the 5150 was the top choice. This would allow for IBM to dominate the market throughout the early 1980s, but there was one major problem. People weren't buying IBM computers because there was some sort of unique feature to them or because people loved the brand. 
Rather, much of IBM's popularity could be explained by their price, and this is never a good thing, as it almost always leads to a race to the bottom. And that's exactly what happened. Dozens of new computer manufacturers like Dell popped up, but there was one key difference between manufacturers like IBM and manufacturers like Dell. The difference was that companies like Dell weren't computer manufacturers at all. They were computer assemblers. They didn't create new architectures or put together software or any of that. They simply sourced the cheapest parts on the market, installed MS-DOS, and called it a day. This allowed them to undercut IBM by significant margins. The Dell Turbo, for example, costed a mere $795, which was half of IBM. And given that IBM hadn't built any brand loyalty, people switched to these counterparts in a heartbeat. And the harsh reality was that IBM simply could not compete at these prices. They simply had far more overhead and R&D expenses. IBM didn't want to call it quits though. So they just stuck around as their PC market share waned year after year after year. And it wasn't until after the dot-com bubble that they would finally decide to pull the plug and sell their PC business to Lenovo. And that marked the end of IBM's foray into consumer products. While IBM had gotten destroyed in the consumer PC market, the commercial business was still doing alright. So they decided to double down on commercial customers, and this led them to a new gold mine, which was servers, databases, and of course, cloud computing. Pretty soon, IBM was starting to turn things around, and it seemed like IBM was very much resurrected. But it wasn't all sunshines and rainbows, because their freedom within the cloud market didn't last all that long. Since then, Basically, every company under the sun has jumped onto the market, whether it be Apple, Google, Dell, Oracle, or Microsoft. They all want a piece of the pie, and this has led to IBM shedding much of its cloud gains. In fact, IBM is very much in a downtrend once again. In the past 10 years, IBM's revenue has nearly halved from over $100 billion to barely $60 billion. A similar story can be seen with their net income as well, which has shrunk from over $15 billion to just $1.2 billion. It seems like investors are still giving IBM a good amount of credit as they've been able to maintain a PE ratio of over 100. But if IBM continues to put up lackluster performance, it's not clear how much longer investors will give them leeway. But that's just what I think. Do you think IBM has a future? Comment that down below. Also, Drop a like if you're grateful for IBM's contributions. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest for video ideas and to consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. Until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.